All right, on to the second lecture for this short series. And we're going to flip back a little bit now and look at what happens at those capillary beds. And we're going to specifically talk about capillary exchange. That means we're on to worksheet 6.2. All right, there are science memes that don't have much to do with science. Got the doctor, he says here, I'm afraid the operation left you completely blind. The person says, I see. And then the doctor says, oh cool, then forget I said anything. In the middle, we have one of my favorite memes. I've shared this a bunch. It says, mad respect for this bird for saving this fish from drowning. It's an osprey carrying off a goldfish or koi. It's just levels upon levels of misunderstood biology. And then uh, on the right here, we have the right nostril at 1 a.m. And if you zoom in, little Peruvian pan flutes going there. So sometimes it sounds like that, huh? All right, moving on. We'll begin today by reviewing the exchange processes we discussed previously um, that occur at the capillaries, including diffusion, vesicular transport, and bulk flow. It's been a couple lectures since we've spoken specifically about capillaries, so here's a quick review before we delve into it today. Um, remember the capillaries, they are thin-walled, there's a single layer of endothelium, and they have a small radius. And we can see the cells there moving in rouleau and single file through that vessel. And the purpose of the capillaries is to allow for exchange, efficient exchange of gases, nutrients, waste, and even hormones. And that exchange process, as we mentioned before, it includes diffusion, vesicular transport, and bulk flow. So let's look at those now individually. The first mechanism of capillary exchange that we'll talk about today is probably the simplest, diffusion. And remember, diffusion is just things moving down their concentration gradients, so moving from high to low concentration. So that means things are going to enter or leave the blood depending upon where they have a high concentration and they're going to go to where that concentration is lower. So things like oxygen, hormones, nutrients, they're going to move from the blood into that intermediary. We said it's the interstitial fluid before they move into the tissue cells. And then things like carbon dioxide and waste, they're going to move from the tissue into the blood. Again, moving through that intermediary, the ISF, interstitial fluid. For a think-pair share, I'd like you to think about what would be the differences uh, between how small solutes are going to diffuse versus larger solutes. What are the different pathways that they could take? And I'll give you a clue. We did touch about them a little bit when we first introduced the capillaries and the different capillary types. Well, the route taken is going to depend on the particle size or the size of that solute. So really small solutes if we're talking about oxygen, CO2, glucose, or different ions, they can diffuse right through the endothelial cells or through those intracellular clefts. And then our larger solutes, those are what are going to pass through the fenestrations within the fenestrated capillaries or the gaps within those sinusoidal capillaries. Okay? This can include things like larger solutes or small proteins. The next method of exchange we'll discuss is vesicular transport. And remember, vesicular transport is where the endothelial cells that line these capillaries, they're going to use penocytosis or exocytosis. Now, I have some information written here, but we'll discuss that on the following slide. Let's say we have a larger uh, solute that we need to move in or out of the blood. Well. This is going to involve penocytosis. Remember that cellular drinking. It's a type of endocytosis. And this is going to be followed then by exocytosis. So this is going to involve the endothelial cells here. And we're going to get this invagination of the cell membrane. We're going to form these fluid-filled vesicles at the plasma membrane. And then we'll transport that vesicle across the cell containing that fluid and that large solute. We're going to secrete the substance on the other side using exocytosis. We're going to dump those vesicular uh, contents. And this process can be used in both directions. So we can move both to and from the blood. 
So we can see here, we're gonna move something from the interstitial fluid outside the cell into the blood across this um, endothelial cell, or we can move from inside the blood across the endothelial cell and out into the ISF. And here we're dumping via exocytosis. We'll now look specifically at bulk flow and look at both filtration and reabsorption. With bulk flow, we're talking about the movement of a large amount of fluid and the things dissolved within it, those dissolved solutes. And this occurs down a pressure gradient. So we're moving from high to low with the movement of those fluids and those dissolved solutes. So it occurs in one direction, bulk flow. Now with bulk flow, the first event we see is filtration. Okay? And this occurs on the arterial end of a capillary. So here we have a capillary, right? the length of it. We have an arterial end and we have a venous end. Filtration is the movement of fluids via bulk flow out of the blood. So we have blood within this capillary and it's going to be pushed through those different openings in the capillaries we discussed. Maybe it's intercellular clefts or fenestrations. So when this happens, fluids and small solutes, I'll try to indicate these here, they move through that capillary easily. They're pushed through. Okay. Whereas the large solutes, let's say we have some large solutes here. Those can't move through, so they're left behind within the blood, okay? So they remain blocked. Now, on the venous end of the capillary, we have reabsorption occurring, and that's the movement of fluid via bulk flow back into the blood. So you're probably asking yourself then, how is it possible to have filtration on one end of the capillary and reabsorption on the other? Well, this is due to hydrostatic pressure and colloid osmotic pressure. Two things we'll define coming up. Okay, let's define hydrostatic pressures and colloid osmotic pressures and then compare the two. To make sense of how we can have filtration on one end of a capillary and reabsorption occurring on the other end, we're gonna begin by discussing hydrostatic pressure and that's the force that is exerted by a fluid. So the first thing we're gonna look at here is blood hydrostatic pressure, or we'll define this as HP sub B. That's hydrostatic pressure of the blood. And that's the force exerted by the blood on the vessel wall. So as the blood moves through this capillary, it's exerting force on the inside of that vessel wall, okay? So because of that, that's gonna drive filtration from the capillary. That's going to push the fluid and the dissolved solutes outward. Okay. Now, contrary to that, we have interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, or hydrostatic pressure sub IF for interstitial fluid. And that's the force of the interstitial fluid that surrounds the capillary out here, pushing in on the outside of that capillary wall. Okay. Now, this is actually close to zero in most tissues. So it's gonna be null, we can kind of ignore it. So the main uh, force, the main hydrostatic pressure we're gonna be looking at here is the hydrostatic pressure of the blood. The other force at work that regulates filtration and reabsorption is osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is the pull of water into an area via osmosis, and that's due to a higher concentration of solutes within that area. So here we're talking specifically about colloid osmotic pressure. Colloid is just another word for protein, so protein osmotic pressure, if you will. So that's the pull of water due to the presence of proteins or colloid. So looking at this image here, I know it's a little blurry, bear with me. In which direction do you think water will move over time. Well, we can see that there's more protein or colloid within this capillary. It's indicated by these orange globules here. Okay. So then we know that over time, water is going to move into the capillary where we have more higher concentration of the colloid or that protein. Okay. So we see a net 
movement of water into that capillary. So water still following the uh, gradient, moving from high water concentration to low water concentration. You might be starting to piece together where we're going with this. You can see now we have two opposing forces. The first, we have the hydrostatic pressure of the blood that is forcing fluid out of the capillary, and that's promoting filtration on one end of the capillary. And then we also just talked about osmotic pressure. So we have these proteins that are left behind, okay, and they're going to pull fluid back into the capillary, and that's promoting reabsorption on the venous end. There are two colloid osmotic pressures we need to discuss, and we'll start with blood colloid osmotic pressure. So we can see that COP for colloid osmotic pressure and then a sub B for blood. And this is the force that's going to drive fluid into the blood due to the presence of proteins. So for example, we have this protein here, albumin. Okay. Albumin is a protein that helps keep fluid within the bloodstream. So we're going to have albumin dissolved within our blood within the capillary and we said that the fluid wants to go where we have more dissolved protein or colloid and in this case we're talking about albumin so fluid is going to want to enter this capillary so that's going to promote reabsorption it's the driving force for reabsorption and this is going to pose the dominant hydrostatic pressure and that's the hydrostatic pressure of the blood that's forcing fluid outward into the interstitial fluid as a counterpart, we also have interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure. That's colloid osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid, sub IF. And this is the force that's going to act to draw fluid into the interstitial fluid. So we are going to have a, you know, some dissolved proteins out here. Perhaps those aren't showing up so well. I'm making them too small. That are going to act to draw fluid out of our capillaries. But there's so few proteins present in the interstitial fluid this is going to be kept pretty low, so around 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury for that pressure. The last thing we'll do is investigate net filtration pressure, and then as part of your in-class assignment, we'll have you calculate net filtration pressure on both arterial and venous ends of a capillary, given hydrostatic and colloid osmotic pressures. How much filtration ultimately occurs at the capillaries is determined by the interaction of the hydrostatic and osmotic pressures. And we call this the net filtration pressure. And that's the difference between the net hydrostatic pressures and the net colloid osmotic pressures. So let's take a look. Uh, we have our capillary here. And the first thing we need to determine is the net hydrostatic pressure, which we say is the difference between the blood and the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressures. So we'll subtract those two. So remember that the blood hydrostatic pressure is the driving force of filtration. Blood's moving through this capillary and it's going to want to push um, the, <coughs> the fluid and the dissolved solutes through that capillary wall. Okay, So we have this outward force against the vessel wall and then we have the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure the returning force of fluids and pressure on the outside of that wall. And remember we said that that was around zero. Okay. So the first part of our equation looks like this. Hydrostatic pressure of the B blood and then hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid IF. And we subtract the two to find net hydrostatic pressure. Okay. It's the difference between the two. Then we have to determine our net colloid osmotic pressures, and that's the difference between the blood and interstitial fluid osmotic pressures. So we'll subtract those two. So first we have the presence of proteins like albumin in here, and that's drawing fluid back into the capillary and driving reabsorption. And then we have a very small force. There's a few proteins dissolved out here in interstitial fluid uh, driving fluid out into the interstitial fluid. So we'll take the net of those. So we do the colloid osmotic pressure of the blood minus the colloid osmotic pressure of the interstitial fluid. Okay, That's going to give us net colloid osmotic pressure. And then we find the difference between these net pressures to give us net filtration 
pressure. Okay. Now, net filtration pressure, this equation we just looked at here, is a slight variation on Starling's law. Uh, there's this physiologist, Ernest Starling, and he was the first to discover that hydrostatic and osmotic forces, they're going to work against one another to drive filtration and reabsorption materials across a capillary wall. Ultimately, what we see is that net filtration pressure changes along the length of the capillary. So indicated here on the bottom, it's going to be lower on the venous end and higher on the arterial end. Okay, so what we see then, as we started this lecture with, is at the arterial end, we are favoring filtration, while on the venous end, we are favoring reabsorption. Now, how do we determine this? Well, we can calculate net filtration pressure on each end, and look at how it varies along the length of that capillary. So using the adjusted Starling's equation that we just did to calculate NFP, we can calculate NFP on this end, and then calculate it again down on the venous end, and look at the difference between the two. What we tend to see is we get a positive value when we calculate NFP on the arterial end, and we end up getting a negative value if we calculate NFP on the venous end. So the positive value is telling us that here filtration is favored and when we get a negative value that is telling us that reabsorption is favored. So back to that question this is how we can have reabsorption favored on one end or filtration favored on the arterial end. And I'm not going to say too much more about this because that's going to be our in-class activity for tomorrow. You are going to work in your small groups, whether um, in class or online, and we're going to give you some actual values. So values for blood hydrostatic pressure or blood colloid osmotic pressure. And you're going to calculate the net filtration pressures on the arterial end of a capillary, venous end of a capillary, and look at whether we're getting, um, whether one end is favoring reabsorption or one end is favoring filtration. Under a normal circumstance, we see that there's net filtration occurring at the arterial end of a capillary and then net reabsorption at the venous end. However, not all of the fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary, so there's more being filtered out. That uh, capillary typically absorbs about 85% of the fluid that's been passed off into the interstitial fluid, but that leaves 15% sitting behind. What happens to that excess 15% of fluid that is not reabsorbed and is remaining out in the interstitial fluid? Well, that's the role of the lymphatic system. It's going to pick up that excess fluid, not reabsorbed at the venous capillary end, and it's going to move it back into venous circulation. Unfortunately, due to time constraints because of block, we won't be talking about the lymphatic system too much more, but I do have a video on net filtration pressure I'm going to show next that will again touch on it. We'll finish today with a video from a physiologist called Dr. Mike. He's going to put it all together for us. Basically how this arrangement of having filtration on one end and then reabsorption on the other end of the capillary is a great system for delivering nutrients to tissues and then ridding them of waste. Um, he's going to talk specifically then about the swelling response that's going to occur with an injury and the associated edema, and then he's going to give us a brief intro into the lymphatic system. And we'll be doing a case study similar to this in class tomorrow. Um, I do want to point out that this is a slightly different drawing the way he draws the capillary. He's going to show the arterial end on the right and then the venous end on the left. So just flip around in your head what we have been doing thus far. I'll put the link up for this whole video on Canvas so you could watch it from the start of his video if you'd like. All right, that's it, and we'll see you later. I'm going to play a video on capillary exchange. This is Dr. Mike. He's been a big student favorite in the past due to his accent, his physiology diagrams, and his tight-fitting t-shirts. But uh, let's see what he has to say about capillary exchange. I find his videos really helpful. that it ends up being a push out 
of 15 millimetres of mercury. Now, these substances, such as, and I'm just going to draw the albumin, is continually moving through. So it's still on this side of the venous end of the capillary. Okay, so this substances are, these substances are moving through, so these proteins are still exerting a pull of the fluid back in. And this pull is still around about 20 millimetres of mercury. So have a look now. If you were to measure the pressures against each other, which one now wins? Well, 15 out, 20 in, the pull in now wins. The difference, 5 millimetres of mercury. So what that means is, at the arterial end, we have a bulk flow or a net flow of fluid being pushed out. And then when we get to the venous end, we have a net flow of fluid being pulled back in. And the reason why this is important is because the fluid that's on this end is handing over oxygen and substances like glucose. And then it's continu continuing past. And then on this end, the tissue is handing it carbon dioxide and waste. And why is that perfect? Because this is where the fluid gets pulled back in and can get taken back to the heart. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Now, the push out and the pull in have names which you need to know. Okay, so the push out, remember I've drawn it in red. So the push out is called the hydrostatic pressure. And basically it's blood pressure, right? Because it's the pressure of the blood being pushed in the walls of the arterial end of the capillary. Okay. The pull in, which I drew in blue, so I'm just going to draw the blue arrow here. The pull in is called colloid osmotic pressure. And I to told you it's the pull of the proteins in the blood pulling that fluid back in. Now, let's just think clinically for one second. What if we were to increase the size of these gaps in the capillaries. Let's say they're now big enough for proteins to move out. So that means that as the blood comes through, 30 millimetres of mercury pressure pushing out, not just fluid comes out, but also the proteins come out as well. If the proteins leave the capillaries, is there any pull back in? No. So that means we have all this bulk flow out, including proteins, and there's no proteins to move to the venous end, so there's no pull back in, which means fluid just continues to accumulate outside the capillaries in an area called the interstitium, meaning between the tissues. This is edema. So when you see a patient who has fluid built up at the bottom of their legs or at the periphery, this is edema. And it can be due to one of the reasons a widened gap between the endothelial cells of your capillaries. Think about inflammation. Inflammation is just injury or damage occurring to vascularized tissue. Everyone's had some form of inflammatory response. Let's say you've cut your hand. What happens? You've got the four cardinal signs of inflammation. You've got the redness, you've got the swelling, you've got the heat, and you've got the pain. Okay, These have been known for thousands of years. But what's one of those that we need to remember? Swelling. So you cut yourself, you always notice swelling at the site. Why? Because when you damage cells of your skin, these cells explode their guts and inside there's histamine. And histamine is a chemical that creates larger gaps in your capillaries. Why? Why would we want this? Because if I were to cut myself... Whatever cut me, let's say it was a nail. What if there was bacteria on that nail? I now have bacteria in my interstitium. Okay? How am I supposed to attack it and kill it if all my white blood cells are in my capillaries? Well, histamine 
opens up the gates. And my white blood cells can come out and attack the bacteria, kill it off. But what that also means is fluid comes out. But this is good as well because the fluid sort of washes it away and dilutes it. Okay? Now, you may think that of all the fluid, under normal situations, of all the fluid that's get, that gets pushed out on the arterial side, that it all gets pulled back in. That's not the case. There is a small percentage of this fluid that once it gets pushed out, it cannot get pulled back in. Now, this is enough, even though it's a fraction of the fluid, it's enough that at the end of the day, if we could not find a way to pull that fluid back in, if we could not pull that fluid back in, our blood pressure would drop enough that we'll die at the end of one day. So it means that of the fluid that can't get pulled back in, we do have a mechanism. We need to get that fluid back. How do we get it back? The lymphatic system. So we have lymphatic vessels as well around our tissues. And the lymphatic vessels help bring back that lost fluid from a capillary exchange and drops it back into our venous supply. So I hope that this made sense looking at capillary exchange.